Welcome back to Inside the Box. I'm Joanna Lee, and today we are celebrating the third episode of the Canadian Artist Series. Today's artist was praised by the Quint Arts Council umbrella for having the extraordinary ability to place the sound of the piano exactly where the soloist needs to be. She has won a grant from the Canada Council for the Arts and the Web Trust Fund at the Glen Gould School and held residencies at the BAM Center for the Arts. Currently, she is a doctoral candidate at Western University. Please give a warm welcome to Petya Stavreva. Welcome, Petya. It is a pleasure to have you here with us today. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to our chat. Absolutely. So let's get started with your origin story. How did you get to where you are musically today? And yeah. Yeah, so um, maybe some people can tell by my name. I was born in Bulgaria and I started playing when I was about four, I think is what my parents tell me. And apparently before I started lessons, I was being very annoying about wanting a piano. I don't remember any of this, but apparently that's what happened. And I kept insisting so much that uh, they get me a piano, not even lessons. I was just like, I need one piano. And so one day I got home. I, this I do remember. Like I got home and uh, my grandfather was there and there was a piano in the living room. And I was like, oh, what? And soon after that, I started having lessons and stuff like that. Um, I have no idea why I wanted that instrument at that young age. I, I still find it a little bit weird. But anyways, that's what happened. And then I started taking lessons with two really great teachers in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. And our studio was kind of like a little family in a way because we I traveled together to so many competitions. Um, like, you know, as little kids, there were more like little festivals like the Kiwanises we have here. So in Bulgaria, they were throughout the whole country. So we traveled together a lot and we played uh, piano duos and had lots of concerts in my little hometown, which I, I remember doing like all of them. They were really fun. Um, yeah, so that was my childhood then. And then I moved to Canada at age 13. Um, so of course, like a tough age to move countries, right? And I didn't speak English and it was all like the whole thing that everybody goes through. Um, and then I started the Young Artist Performance Academy which now is called the Taylor Academy in Toronto, okay. um, where I studied with with a uh, Bulgarian teacher, Arshalou. And uh, it was a great program for um, for children aged, I think, seven to 18 or something like that. And it still exists today, like I said. Um, and there I met my best friend, uh, Sarah. <laughs> it's just a, a little funny story how we met. Um, we took piano duos together and they signed us as partners. And I don't know, she said something that I, I at the time, I, I didn't find very, like, I was like, who is this girl? We're not gonna get along. <laughs> so, and then like, you know, years later, she ended up being my bridesmaid. So it was um, like such a special program to me for that reason alone. And for others too, of course, I learned, learned a lot. Um, and then I went into my undergrad at U of T, um, started, working as a collaborative pianist a little bit, like just to try it out. And then I did my artist diploma at GGS, where I continued to play with instrumentalists and singers and started teaching a little, uh, which I'll get into later. And after that, I had a gap year where I went to Banff actually, and it was incredible. I did a winter residence there for about maybe 10 weeks or so, mm -hmm. an amazing place. Um, and then after that, I did my master's at UT Austin in solo piano and also studied a bit of uh, collaborative piano um, as a side project. Mm -hmm. it was a, they made it a course or something. It was also really awesome. And then I went to do my DMA at Western, which is in London, Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still there. I'm still finishing up. I have a few weeks left. So, you know, so many schools that happened. Um, and between the schools, I did summer festivals like you know, all of us do that. Uh, so th that took up all my summers. I went to so many great places that I probably wouldn't have otherwise gone to. You know, I went to LA, I went to Nice, 
of course Banff I did a few summer programs there the solo in the chamber one uh, and of course Ottawa and my I think one of my favorites probably Bowdoin which is in Maine and it's gorgeous it had you know he has the ocean there and it's so green and I met so many great people there actually at all these festivals and all these schools um you meet like a lot of lifelong friends that we you know we still keep in touch with after all these years so anyway now I live in Toronto and uh hopefully we'll be soon finished with my last degree which is the DMA yes <laughs> and hopefully late August or beginning of September mm-hmm. and uh what I'm focusing on right now is just planning a, a few programs a couple of programs for next year so I have to learn a bunch of things and mostly I'm focusing on expanding my teaching studio which is a big passion oh wow that's amazing yeah you have such a versatile um, background and it's very international and um, well-rounded so it's always good to hear you know where you ended up and where you started yeah so let's talk about the main roles and ensembles you are currently involved in today yeah so i most recently finished um a recording project for the rcm's new violin series where i played um, a few pieces with marie berard who was a goddess to work with um, such a beautiful artist and um we did a few sessions so now that project is finished um with all the, the COVID restrictions, it kept being postponed so many times. So we finally got it done last week, I believe. Oh, and cool. yeah, so currently I'm teaching a little bit. Um, throughout the summer, a lot of people are gone because they, and I encourage that to take vacations. So um, I'm still teaching a few, but mostly finishing my paper. That's my big thing right now to get that done and submit it. Yeah, I'm rooting for you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what do you believe was the key factor in winning grants and scholarships? Oh, um, I think we had a really great course, uh, GGS with Andrew Kwan, uh, that was, I think it was mandatory to take, which is a great thing to, to do because he taught us a lot of things that I would have, I don't think I would have ever found out on my own. Yeah. Um, like. Of course, I knew we had to have, you know, professional um, recordings with professional sound, but I didn't realize how specific something needed to be. Yes. So as part of, um, I think it was our last project, we had to do a, a real grant as if we were to submit it to Canada Arts Council and uh, come up with an idea uh, to get funding. And also after that, we formed panels and then adjudicated everybody's it was anonymous. I don't remember how it worked in that aspect, but we met it anonymous, but with real recordings and, you know, our own grants. And that yeah. was, I think, where I learned the most. Um, I think the, maybe the most important thing is to really have a very professional recording and something that shows a lot of things early on in the recording. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because there's so many pieces that start off, you know, kind of a little bit slow and then you show more, things later so yeah. I learned the importance pick a piece that really uh, tells them who you are in the yeah. beginning and then the other small it's like a really small thing but to pay attention to all of their uh, requirements and instructions to the dot because I remember we tossed out some grants that had just one small mistake because the rationale is they get so many to read that they'll just be like oh this makes it easier okay we're gonna put that one away so you know really pay attention to what they want even if it's something small like a font size just just do it um so (laughs) then yeah um after that course is actually when i ended up applying for the canada arts council uh really did not expect to get anything um but i i got the full grant and it it helped support me in my master's so it was like it made it possible for me to go because you know the state is fairly expensive um so yeah i would i would say just those things uh, focus on the details and really have a really good recording and just you know be yourself of course and i think i forgot to mention like your idea has to be very good Mm. so 
really think about that and and you have to convince them about why they need they should help you so i would yeah i would say focus on those things yeah okay those are good tips and uh, i'm sure our audience really appreciates your expertise on this yeah so speaking of education what is it like to have multiple roles as a soloist ensemble performer and a teacher Oh, well, it can get a little bit exhausting, I guess, at times. Mm -hmm. uh, but I noticed that a lot of us are doing that more and more over the past few years. A lot of people have different hats. And I, I think it's good because, you know, everything relates to each other. Um, your playing will influence your teaching and your teaching will influence your playing. Your playing with other people will also influence your solo playing and vice versa and all these things. Yeah, yeah I think they go together. Uh, and yeah you can i know you can be a little bit tiring but i think it's good to have to be versatile and keep things interesting i guess yeah you're right it it does um help you be a more well-rounded person as well as a musician and it it teaches you about life in a way <laughs> oh very very much so totally yeah absolutely so is there one role that you prefer um I think there are maybe two. Okay. I, mm, so I'm not really particularly a solo player at heart. I know maybe um, some people will be surprised by that because all my degrees were in solo piano, but there's a reason for that. Yeah. Um, I, I love piano music and I'm a teacher at heart. That's, that's who I've realized I am over the last few years. Um, sometimes it takes a while to figure it out, you know, but you can be many things. And for me, that I don't think that's really solo music. Although I think it's important to keep always keep playing solo for us as pianists, Absolutely. because it is the most challenging um, in my experience. Maybe some people have different experiences with that, but for me, it really is, and it teaches you a lot. You need to become a better timbre player. Uh, and for the for the teaching, um, I I didn't expect to love teaching so much, to be honest. Um, so when I first started. I just I don't I don't think I knew a lot of things, of course, because when you're like 19, you don't know a lot um, as much as you know you're going to, which happened. Um, so I didn't really love it at first, and yeah. then the more I, the more I learned, um, the more I started to really get into it. And I would say um, my pedagogy professor at UB Austin was really the biggest reason I think that I became you know a teacher because she taught us so many valuable things in her classes that uh, I don't know where I would have learned otherwise. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of ignited this like love for the, for, the, for the craft. And then little by little started expanding my studio, kept learning, of course, you have to keep learning as yeah. you go. Absolutely. And now um, I, I have a fairly big studio coming in in September. So I'm really happy about that. I'm going to focus on that and some chamber concerts uh, for the next year, and I'm, I'm just I'm excited because it's going to be my first real time out of school. Um, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that for sure. Absolutely. I mean, chamber music is wonderful. It's one of my favorite things. So one day you and I should collaborate. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we should. Yeah. So speaking of collaboration, how do you balance the role of professional musician? And life as a doctoral candidate as well as an, as marriage yeah that's an interesting question um because balancing out a uh, professional uh life as a professional musician and a doctoral student i did not do that well at all i have to say um i just i packed my schedule so much over mm -hmm. i would say most of my degree and you know the first two years of a dma are usually very busy Yes, right. absolutely. So I didn't realize how busy it would be, I guess. And, you know, I was living in, in two cities also because Todd was, my husband, was in Toronto and I was in London. So what I did was I spent five days in London <clears throat> and then drove, drove back to Toronto, taught on the weekend, drove back during the week, you know, and then I did that for about three years, right before COVID started. Um, and I didn't give myself a day off even, which I know, like, I understand <clears throat> the mentality of, you know, I have to work really hard to accomplish the things I want to accomplish and to get better and to keep mm -hmm. learning. 
absolutely. And I, I think maybe in your undergrad, which you know, it was also packed like that for me. Uh, that's okay to do, and it's. I think I think maybe it's expected, and there's a good reason for that because it teaches a lot of things. But I think the later you get in life, I don't think it works like that anymore. I think you need to be able to kind of have a little break here and there, and that's just something I learned kind of late, to be honest. And yeah. like I, I remember seeing a couple of friends when I when we were in Austin. And they were leaving the school to go to a yoga class. And my first thought was, how did they find the time? Like, I, <laughs> I could not. And the, like, later I thought about it. And I'm like, that's not a normal thought. Like, people should have time to go to a yoga class, go see a movie, whatever, to have one, hopefully two days off. And I, yeah, I didn't really do that until maybe a year ago, maybe a, a year and a half. So a little bit before the pandemic started, mm-hmm. I made a point to just schedule one day of the week that I wasn't going to you know, do anything too much. I mean, I still practice, but you know, you have to practice. Um, but it was just a little bit crazy. And I'm glad I realized these things because I also had an injury uh, during my, I think it was my second year of DMA. Uh, just a little like thing from a car. It wasn't really an accident, it was a near accident, but the maneuver itself really did something to my wrist. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't stop after that either. <clears throat> I kept like going to rehearsals and for my TA ship and everything. And I was like, in my mind at the time, I'm like, okay, I'm going to find, oh, I can find a position of the hand that it doesn't hurt that much when I play. Yeah. And so I did that. And then it made it worse because my fingers started going numb eventually. Yeah. And, you know, I started going to all the physios and everything and doctors and stuff. And later, when I think, yeah, it was a little bit, it was into the pandemic, I think. So last year, maybe April, May, those months, I started to, because we stopped doing everything, right? I stopped driving. I stopped really practicing much. Mm -hmm. And then it went away. Like, it started to get better. And I I, I had to think, like, what was I doing different? I'm like, okay, I'm not driving anymore. Because, and it was also fear, right? a nurse pinched in the neck i'm like okay so i'm not sitting like in a horrible posture in the car for four hours um every every week i guess yeah and not playing so okay and then i tried to figure out those things and long story short between that and you know video and everything um it, it, it's okay now but okay. my whole point of that story is that even something that was pretty bad didn't i didn't even take a break for that uh, maybe like a couple of days, you know, when it really hurt at first when I couldn't hold the mug. So yeah, I took a break then. But it, I don't think it's 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 good because I I wasted so much time. I could have you know played more and things like that if I just you know took the time off to really analyze what's happening to give the hand a break. And yeah. I feel like if you say no to something, then you know uh, your chances of getting hired for something else are going to be ruined now. So it it shouldn't work like that and I think it's really important for people to realize that that it, there's no downside there's actually a huge plus side and there's a little bit of balance in your life um, as musicians I know we drive ourselves a little bit too crazy sometimes and it's okay to say no to just say no you know what we can hire someone else because I can't put anything else on my plate and that there's nothing wrong with that yeah. so, Life won't stop. You won't lose all your future gigs. Um, yeah. We're gonna respect the fact that you're able to say to, to know where your limit is, and you know, if you can't do it, you can't. And and just in, enjoy life a little bit more than you know, just being working like crazy. So anyway, that's my little story about that. And you know, I'm sure even one person who's watching this, if if they're have ever gone through an injury or something like that and think it's okay to just keep going it's not it can go on for years if you actually it can it really can mine went on it didn't have to last for what three four years that it did and you know it it, it hurt and nobody likes their fingers going numb no you can't do the one thing that you're trying to accomplish it's just not worth it so i don't know just take the time off and don't feel guilty about it at all yeah and do physio because that's absolutely yeah 
and yeah, so self-care is not selfish you have to take care of your health in order to yeah. be, you know a tip-top musician you know you have to be in shape like an athlete before you start playing or practicing yeah. or yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah i mean like I, I i like the saying if you don't uh take a, a day of rest your body's gonna do it for you because yeah. eventually you're gonna burn out and you're gonna can really crash easily you don't need to do that at Absolutely. all you're right right i i really like and respect that you advocate this because that's also my philosophy as well and i think it's really important to let our audience know that this is the type of mindset that it is you know that you need to allow for yourself in order to yeah. see a, the bigger picture of success and i think that's how you'll get through you know such obstacles i guess yeah yeah and like you know don't feel guilty if you you know for some reason need to go home earlier one day just 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 do that like i, I remember when i was a, i think i was a gs and okay yeah i had many goals you know uh at that time because i really wanted to work on my sound production so i practiced a lot like i, I was at the school from 10 uh, then to two i would practice then i had classes working whatever and practice more so i didn't go home from 10 to 9 like mm-hmm. You know, all day of school or at work, whatever. And then one day I remember I left at eight and I felt so guilty. I was like, no, there, there's like one more hour to be productive. Like, <laughs> but I was, I was so tired and hungry and I'm like, okay. So I went home, but I felt guilty about it. Like, and I know others have the same thing. It's just, you know, it, it's just not okay. Like, but it's also human not productive if you practice too much. You also find yourself making more mistakes because your productivity level goes down by 20 percent every two hours so apparently scientifically proven too um and this was done by studies and you know it's it's really hard to stop ourselves and i i also uh, suffer the same consequences when i do the same things you do Uh, i think it's a common musician performance major i think so definitely yeah but it's good you bring this up because this isn't a topic that's easily discussed and you know it's good to advocate these things and to let others know that it's okay to take a break it's okay to not practice five hours in a row if it's not going to actually help you it's and harm you actually um it's much better to get two hours of really solid practice take a break and then come back to it if you need to. But I think the recommendation is don't do over four hours. Mm, Wow. Especially the strength. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I think that's also why orchestras, the players, they face a lot of injuries because it's repetitive Mm. strain, right? That's the common injury. That's the common denominator that all musicians have. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, you really have to be but I totally get what you mean by wanting to stay there for 10 hours and just keep playing because there's so much repertoire to get through during uni yeah there's so much to do yeah, yeah. it's crazy oh man well you know speaking of your experiences as a student based on both experiences as a student and teacher how should one approach teaching and educating students well, I mean, I can just say what I've observed. I don't know yet what the best method is. Like, there's always stuff to learn. But what I've noticed so far is that you need to realize all students learn differently. You can't just be, you can't expect all of them to tailor themselves to you. I think you need to tailor yourself to them, which is hard. And, you know, um, it takes a lot of imagination and, you know, patience to learn how to do that. Um, but then it makes everything better because you can channel the way that the student learns into your into what you're doing with them in the lessons and after the lessons um then it's it makes it a lot better and they progress faster uh, so that's one thing um another one is to, to teach them how to think um critically so i ask a lot of questions when i teach 
And yeah, I, I remember my previous teachers have done the same thing. So of course, I've picked up a lot of things from different teachers subconsciously, maybe even that I don't even realize sometimes. But um, I do that a lot with my students because then they start, they have to think, and I don't give up. I always sit there and wait for the answer. Um, and it, because then they will come up with one. And ultimately, after that, if they have a similar question, they're going to be able to figure it out, which I think is important. We need to, I think, teach them how to not need us, Absolutely. ultimately, in yeah. the end. Um, of course, it's always good to have someone here you play uh, <laughs> yeah. for like perspective. But yeah, so a lot of things that you can teach them are valuable. I think that's probably the most valuable. Um, and of course, injury prevention and all these things. Mm -hmm. So sound production, like for pianists, that's very important because it can easily lead to an injury if you're not careful. Uh, yeah. So I, I think there needs to be a little more focus on that. Uh, because I, I've noticed a lot of people just kind of wanting to learn how to do that. Yeah. And we need to focus more on that for sure. So um, objectivity is the, the main point here and being able to um, ask the questions that would uh, lead them in a direction that would help, you know, make their personality shine in other words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I, I agree with that. Yeah, so it sounds like you get really inspired by your own students. Uh, speaking of inspiration, where do you get your inspiration as a performer? Oh, yes. um, so usually I, I try to listen to a lot of things to kind of inspire me. Um, that, that's, that's, the, the music itself is my biggest source of inspiration. I also love watching concerts and and you know, seeing Paul is playing students play. Mm -hmm. um, and, but yeah, listening to, to pieces that you might not sometimes have heard of. Like from my dissertation, I ended up writing about Lazano's first piano sonata, which oh. I played years ago. Um, but I didn't know that piece. And I remember, I think I was in band. Like it's so vivid in my memory, all, all that. And I was listening to my friend, um, who had a new, I think it was a new recording on YouTube, and I was like, oh, cool, let's check it out. And I heard that sonata, and I was like, no way. I love Mark Modernoff, and I, I knew nothing of the first sonata. Where was this piece been hiding all this time? And then I learned it after that. It's uh, kind of a, it's not the easiest piece to get into, but you know, the way he played it was just so captivating. And I probably have heard the piece before, but it was that person's interpretation that I was just like, oh my god, I have to learn this piece. And you know, then I ended up using it to write for my dissertation. So sometimes it's weird things can happen when you listen to pieces randomly. So I, I try to do that. Well, speaking of Maninoff, uh, and this is related to my thesis, he's considered as sort of like a bel canto era type of pianist. And he collaborated with Fritz Kreisler, who I'm also I'm writing a dissertation on. And wow. I found, you know, his recordings on his own works incredible. Mm -hmm. His interpretation is just, you know, it has a very singing quality. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. So I could see the appeal for sure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I know Rachmaninoff is one of your favorite composers, um, but when selecting a repertoire as a performer, who would you say is your biggest musical influence? Uh, yeah, for that, I um, it kind of depends. So I tend to have a really hard time with uh, choosing solo music to play. I don't know why. It's always such a struggle, and I can't figure out why. Um, and, and then you get into chamber stuff and duo stuff, and I want to play like a thousand things. <laughs> yeah. For solo stuff, for like all my good it was just painful to come up with a program that was, you know, coherent and it made sense and that I love. So I don't know. What I've done in the past, just, it, it came randomly. I would hear a piece and then really like it and end up putting that on a program with maybe something else. And usually, you know, even if you don't love the piece so much, you do end up doing that as you work on it anyway. So. All that to say, I, I don't know why I have such a hard time picking up music, but yeah, that's what happens to me. I guess you can always, you have a person to discuss it with too, 
that's oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> yeah. And he's always like, what? There's so many things to play. And yeah, I, I know. I know there's a ton of piano repertoire. I shouldn't even complain. But I think maybe because my... Way too my... much to the point where it's it's hard yeah. to play one because you want to play everything. <laughs> that too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So speaking of collaborations, how do you personally decide on who to collaborate with? Hmm. Well, things happen sometimes randomly. Um, but it's usually people that I know uh, or have met in the past and, you know, it's good to work with, with many different people and get, get some ideas and learn. And, of course, being married to piano, I have to do piano too. Um, so, yeah, no, we, we decided on that like, really early on because we have so much fun playing together and it's easy to collaborate. Um, yeah. it's, it's just nice when that happens, so we're, we're going to try and learn some repertoire together uh, very soon. Oh, but, uh, you're going to do duets and do concerts together. Yeah, we have, we have, I think we have one for 2022 and then we try to play that program somewhere else in other places and we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, if you put it on your website, um, it will constantly be updated so our audience will be able to see when your schedule is whenever you have performances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm going to divert to a different question with current events. With the way of the world today, how can we bring in cultural diversity and openness to society, especially during these times? Mm, yeah, that's a really important question. And I mean, in Canada, we're kind of blessed to already have such a diverse community, but I think we need to do better. And uh, I was thinking about this earlier too. And I, I think the biggest thing we need to do to start with education. Um, I've been to four schools and a pre-college program and I can tell you, and people know this, like we mm -hmm. end up learning the, kind of the same things. And I don't, I'm not sure why. And it's funny because when, when I came down to this room, I saw this guy. <laughs> of, it was literally I, I like all, the textbook, the textbook. And then I looked at the recording section and all you see is like Chopin, this, Brahms, Brahms, Verdi, Wagner. Oh my goodness. It was, it was on like a single name I didn't recognize here. And I, I just, I don't think that's right. And I'll, I'll tell you why. So a couple of weeks ago, um, I was practicing something at home and I was like cleaning dishes or something. Uh, and then he, he started playing this really beautiful piece that I hadn't heard before. He was like learning something for recording. Mm -hmm. And I just stopped and had to listen to it. It was so beautiful. And I was like, oh my God. I, I don't even know. I don't know who this composer. Who could who could this be? And I didn't know. And so I found out it was a composer called um, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who was an English composer of um, African origins that lived in England in the 1900s. So I have never heard of this composer before. So I, I researched him a little bit and found that you know he actually wrote quite a bit of music and it's really good. And yeah. um, his daughters and his son, they were also, uh, he was a music, in a musical family. And then I started thinking, how many other composers are there like this that we haven't heard of, that are, you know, not the standards that we usually have to learn about, you know, including, you know, Tom Severity and all that stuff and what an organum is. And we don't know about Samuel Taylor. Why is that? And I, I just, I think it needs to change there. People need to rewrite these textbooks and we need to see what else was there because clearly there was quite a bit and I'm, I'm gonna try and learn on my own as well because I yeah. don't know enough and so that's what I'll do but you know if, if people are going to a university program they should learn a little more diversity that's that's where I would start yeah I think in the fact that Canada you know U of T um, makes you audition with the Canadian composer. I think that's a good start. But yeah, it, that's that's really good. It's it's great in a way, but I've also noticed that there's a lot of, um, and this is a little bit of an uncomfortable topic. I know, a bit mm -hmm. of white privilege and uh, male oriented, and I find yeah. that the only female composer I can think of that really sticks out for violin repertoire that has some notoriety um, is. Uh, Gramate, Eckhart's Gramate, right? Mm, yeah. So Carmen Eckhart's Gramate. 
And I feel that if we look beyond that, we would be able to find other composers of color, um, even indigenous population or um, female artists of color, female composers. Yeah, right? definitely. So I find that uh, system needs to be a bit more adaptable and open to bringing those composers in and bringing more light into that. And for me, um, what I do now is I look for Korean because of my culture. I look yeah, for I Korean thing. composers yeah. because I find yeah. it really takes me back to my roots. And it also, mm -hmm. you know, allows me to share if I'm doing chamber music. Like say you were Todd, um, to play that type of music to, you know, send word of that composer. And this composer is live today and it's uh, yeah, it's amazing. So I think it's it's really important to acknowledge today's composers as well as um, yeah, for those sure. Really apps. Yeah. So yeah. Much talent. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I think. You know, I, I think Todd mentioned it to me too in one of the conversations. He did mention you were you were doing something and you really enjoyed the piece as well. And maybe it was yeah, that. absolutely. I think it's it's a wonderful idea. Even maybe thinking of a recording project or a concert for these type of composers, like um, in order to promote more diversity in our piece. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, you know, you're a very well accomplished um, musician and professional woman. And I was wondering, what are your proudest accomplishments? Oh, um, I don't know. Not that much. <laughs> uh, I, I would maybe say, um, this might say sound crazy to people, but it's just from my personal experience would be if I finish, which I hope I will, my DMA degree, because okay. you had <laughs> You're almost there. my previous, <laughs> yeah, yeah, then my previous degree that, uh, you know, there were many times where I was like, I'm, I quit, you know, like I, I failed my comp exam, one of my comp exam questions, so I think we do the essay, they, they say it wasn't a fail, but you know, to me, it's still a fail. So it was a fail, like, it, that's actually quite common. Actually. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I was just, you know, stuff like that happened and the injury. Um, and of course, then the pandemic started last year, like when I was, like I had that year prepared. So the last DMA recital I did, it, was still, it wasn't, it, it was, I'll, I'll tell you about it, um, was in April. And we, um, to, like we prepared for these recitals knowing there would be no audience and everything so I don't know I just found it really hard um it was probably the hardest program I've ever played not because of the musical challenges but because of the weirdness that was that whole time and you know being, not being able to be with friends to play for them the program and having no audience and having your committee watch you through the zoom thing and it was just very strange and isolating and I I don't know, I guess I got resilient from that. And I, I have so much respect for people that continue playing concerts for empty halls because it is hard. It is so hard. It, is, it and, totally is. I, I remember. Yeah, it is, last. right? Um, yeah. Oh my God. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I, I guess I would pick that if I had to pick one thing. And I will see what, what I happens think later on. The general thing is that you really got through the adversity and you came out it's like the journey is still happening for you, but you faced a lot of obstacles and overcame all these obstacles and challenges in your own way. And um, it sounds like a lot of growth and self-actualization. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah I, I think what people go through in this degree is exactly like this. You know, like how you go through that. I think I'm in the same boat as you. <laughs> Yeah, I would imagine, yeah. Uh, so, as a leader in the Canadian music scene, how would you help or inspire future generations? Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> because I teach so much, I think uh, I would just keep inspiring younger and younger people uh, from now on, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And uh, just keep teaching them things and inspiring them to want to go to concerts and to keep playing because it's 
so so beneficial especially for children and um yeah I'm, i'm just looking forward to the future because now i can focus more on teaching so i think that's going to be my main way to help the future generation i mean as much as i can of course that's you know that's amazing that you really take teaching it to heart and it's like your purpose to better the world with your teaching i, I really respect it's that fun. <laughs> it's fun yeah so i'm going to throw a cultural question for you because this is and this is open ended so um what does it personally mean to be a canadian especially since you're very culturally diverse um yeah so i actually don't really know to be honest because uh yeah i guess i've spent more more than half of my life in canada so i do feel canadian but i'm also bulgarian so i think a lot of uh immigrants like me i think we all feel that that way a little bit so that i'm not sure which way we're being pulled sometimes <laughs> um but i i do i can say that um in canada we're come from so many different backgrounds and i don't think it, of course it shouldn't matter where you're from and we're all canadian that way and we all bring our cultures are as part of the canadian culture i think canadian culture is made up of many different different cultures and that's what makes it so special so i would say that that's maybe what it means to be canadian to me just being from around the world coming together and yeah that's that's amazing and the fact that you you know really embrace other cultures i think that speaks volumes to you, who you are as a person not only as a canadian but in an individual way and um yeah it's absolutely great um so i for my last question I was wondering how did you celebrate Canada Day this year? Ah, yes. It was a little bit of a darker Canada Day, right? Yeah. Um because of all these horrible things that we have really discovered. Um so of course that I think that came into account. Well, I was with my family. We were at a party. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, you know, spending time together and I think on Canada Day all of us kind of felt it being a little different. Um so you know, we talked about things. and uh, you know, we just we spend time together and you know, have dinner and spend time in nature which uh, is really good to do after being inside for so long mm. um so yeah that's how we marked it we were um kind of just chilling so, yeah i know the meaning has definitely changed from what it was last year to this year especially with the uh current news with the indigenous community and Um my heart really goes out to them. I I know it's never been easy for them and you know you see other parts of the world like New Zealand and how the indigenous people are treated and you know they're getting treated a lot with more respect than people in Canada. And I I think that's a great way to promote awareness in that sort of way but um yeah I guess spending time in nature is also very Canadian. Yeah, yeah. There's so many beautiful parts of Canada and in Ontario. So. Yeah. Well, Petcha, it was absolutely a pleasure to have you here. So, thanks for sharing your thoughts and your talents with us today. And um for our viewers, thank you for tuning in. Your support and time means the world. After this, you will have the opportunity to watch some of Petcha's performances here, and you will definitely not want to miss it. So, please enjoy don't forget to hit the like button subscribe and hit the notification bell also feel free to leave comments for us in the meantime please be well and keep showing up and supporting brilliant artists like petcha see you next time bye